today's corporate casket was sponsored by Daily Harvest. everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now, this is a video I have wanted to make for a while now. I don't really know what took me so long, especially since you guys so obviously know on the channel that I would not be a fan of flat earthers, but I just, I don't know. It just took me a while, I guess. The other part was that I really did not want to approach this video as a joke because let me tell you, I want to so badly, but I really have to try and give this a fair shake just like I would any other organization. This is not a video to make fun of people that are objectively delusional or willingly misguided. This video is to explore why people believe what they do and how some groups of cultish mindsets can become so set in their ways that there's no amount of truth that can convince them otherwise. And yeah, there is obviously bound to be a few awkward laughs here and there because I don't think I'm gonna be able to be 100% serious when talking about this. So today we are going to finally be talking about the Flat Earth Society. Ever since I saw the Netflix documentary Behind the Curve in 2018, I've always been curious about Flat Earth. Now as a concept, it's pretty laughable, but as a group, now, the thing is, for those of you that have not seen the documentary, there's a lot of like different smaller groups in the whole flat earth belief system. And it encompasses a whole lot more than just the earth is flat. It's often more complicated than that because when you have one massive belief that's so easily debunked, it takes other beliefs and strange reasoning to support the theory. Like, you know what I mean? Now, I realize I'm getting a little ahead of myself and I'm pretty ready to jump the gun on this, but let's go ahead and start with where modern flat earth societies even came from. So these modern flat earth societies began with a man named Samuel Robotham. Mark Sargent as featured in the Netflix documentary, which is by the way, someone who's emailed me before when I've poked fun at flat earth and Yes, Mark, I've seen the documentary and no, Mark, it did not change my mind. I think you're still a little loopy, but let's keep going. Now, Mark Sargent was featured in a Netflix documentary that is widely seen as one of the modern leaders of Flat Earth. And we will get to him because, you know, I got a bit invested in this, but for all the wrong reasons, really. Now, while he is considered like the modern leader of the Flat Earth Society, Samuel, born in 1816, he was like an English inventor and writer and he wrote a book called Zetetic Astronomy. He's the guy that's considered to be kind of like the founder of these beliefs. He's also created such stunning works such as Earth Not a Globe under the pseudonym Parallax. And no, by the way, he was not an astronomer, though he used the Zetetic Astronomy as he referred to it. And that basically just models the earth as an enclosed plane centered at the North Pole and bound by walls of ice at the perimeter. You guys have probably seen this memed on way too many times, but this is kind of where it came from. Now, according to Samuel, we're all living in some sort of terrarium-like environment. And this is what many flat earthers actually believe today. And it's also what Mark Sargent states that he believes at the beginning of Behind the Curve. The big question here obviously is why? Why did Samuel believe this? And how could his beliefs gain so much traction that they're still used today when they're so unbelievably, uh, unbelievable? Well, this is due to at least partially the Bedford level experiment. Samuel argued that if the earth is a globe, it should of course curve in some places. There was a canal in England called the Old Bedford that he used for experiments. This canal is 20 miles in length and passes in a straight line. The water is nearly stationary, which I guess to Samuel proved that the earth was flat because a long canal was stationary and that means that the earth is not a globe. The funny thing here is that at first, no one really believed him. He got very little attention overall. It wasn't until in 1870, a supporter by the name of John Hampton offered a wager that he could prove the earth was flat, that people started to care. A naturalist and qualified surveyor, Alfred Russell Wallace took that bet. And here's what happened according to Scientific American. In January of 1870, Alfred Russell Wallace found himself on a collision course with a group of creationists who fervently believe the earth is flat. 
The father of biogeography, co-discoverer of the theory of evolution by natural selection, seems an unlikely sort to be mixed in with religious fanatics on a question of geography settled in the third century BC. Why was such a venerable 19th century man of science accepting wagers from flat earthers regarding the shape of our planet? Simply put, it looked like easy money. Charles Darwin and Charles Lyell ignored the bet, but it's worth noting here that Wallace at the time had a quote, open, trusting nature and perpetual near poverty, end quote. So it doesn't seem like Wallace was just trying to openly mock them. He was just honestly down to win an easy bet. And at first it was easy money. He did win the bet after all. He set a straight line 13 feet above the water and added poles in the middle that could be used to see the curvature. And you know, since like the earth isn't flat, Wallace won. But Samuel and Hampton were pissed. Apparently Hampton threatened to kill him and Wallace was later criticized by his peers for his involvement in a bet to decide the most fundamental and established of scientific facts. In other words, other scientists told him he was stupid for even humoring these people. Wallace wrote about his experience with Hampton and Samuel later, stating that the matter cost me 15 years of continued worry, litigation, and persecution with the final loss of several hundred pounds. And it was all brought upon me by my own ignorance and my own fault. Ignorance of the facts so well shown by the late Professor de Morgan that paradoxers, as he termed them, can never be convinced and my fault in wishing to get money by any kind of wager. It constitutes therefore the most regrettable incident of my life. And I really feel like this is a crucial part of the story. The thing is, I try to encourage healthy debate on this channel. Some things are pretty black and white but there are many topics or situations that fall into a gray area here. And that's why I want your opinions in the first place. Whether it's about what consequences someone might face after taking part in criminal activity or things of that nature. I'm a firm believer in civil discussion with everyone because everyone deserves to be heard, right? Well, I'm not sure. Not anymore, that is. Because the thing is, Wallace took up a bet that Hampton offered, proved on their terms that the earth was curved and he still received death threats for it. Some people simply cannot be reasoned with and cannot be debated. So I'm not saying that every single flat earther is like that, but I guess my unfortunate point here is just don't try to prove a point to people and debate people that are so close-minded that they would rather threaten your life than hear you out. But anyway, despite the evidence, the idea of the earth being flat caught on with some people during that era somehow. The International Flat Earth Research Society of America continued to grow out of these beliefs. Samuel Robotham at first called them the Universal Zetetic Society before the name was changed. A different Samuel, Samuel Shenton, led the society before he died in 1972 and passed the leadership to Charles Johnson, who died in 2001. Charles Johnson apparently believed in flat earth because an elementary school teacher failed to explain to him the concept of gravity in a way he could understand. His wife, Marjorie, also believed in a flat earth because she did not hang from her toes when she was in Australia. And I'm not bullshitting you. That's, that's legitimately her reasoning why. It seems like the Johnsons were just taught gravity in some kind of simplified way, I, or maybe a way that just didn't quite make sense to them. And they just decided, well, that's it. We're never gonna ask any more questions again, and that's final. Now, for a while, the Flat Earth Society died down a bit. They never completely vanished, but things were quiet. When Johnson passed and his wife, who managed the membership database, also passed, it seemed like the group may have finally had the opportunity to fade out. And that is until Daniel Shenton got involved. And no, he's actually not related to Samuel Shenton from before. I guess Shenton is just a common last name among Flat Earth Society leaders. In 2004, Daniel issued a press release for the Flat Earth Society opening to new members. And here's what it had to say. The Flat Earth Society is officially launching its new website and opening membership to new members for the first time since 2001. The website now online at www.theflatearthsociety.org features the largest public collection of flat earth literature in the world as well as a comprehensive user edited encyclopedia and a thriving online discussion forum with over half a million messages. The official launch of the website marks an important transition for the Flat Earth Society. Traditionally, the Flat Earth Society has communicated with its members through printed newsletters, such as the Earth Not A Globe Review and Flat Earth News. Technology has moved on and we are thrilled to be able to reach a much broader audience with our message, Flat Earth Society President Daniel Shenton said. The internet is an amazing tool for communication. 
The Flat Earth Forums, a web message board run by the Society, has gathered over 16,000 users and half a million messages before its launch in 2004. Although membership in the Society went through a period of decline in the late 1990s, there has recently been a resurgence in interest, according to Shenton. In the past two years, there have been major books published about the Flat Earth Movement, as well as articles on the BBC website and Fox News, which included interviews with one of the Society's most prominent members, James McIntyre. According to him, the myth of globularism has been proselytized for centuries by the scientific establishment. We seek to challenge that dogma. Shenton adds, I think we're capturing the public's imagination and that's very important. I realize that our views are still considered highly unorthodox, but people are beginning to ask questions and that's the first step in a long process of truth seeking. Other countries like Canada and Italy have their own history with flat earth. So I'm not going to get into all of it, but I do want to explain why I think this growth is happening. The thing is, believe it or not, Mark Sargent from Behind the Curve explains it best, which, whoo, but here we go. He says that the reason why we're winning is because science throws a lot of numbers at you. Whereas I can point and say, there's Seattle. You shouldn't be able to see it from here. He's in his mom's backyard, pointing across a body of water to the city skyline. The thing is, I think most of us watching can easily debunk Mark. Yes, the earth is a globe, but it's gradual too. The reason he can see Seattle is because the earth curves somewhere between eight inches per mile. So Seattle, which isn't that far away from Mark's mother's home, isn't going to just disappear behind the earth's curvature as Mark states it would. But the thing is, Mark is right about one thing. It sounds simpler, initially. When you get into all the convoluted conspiracies that you have to believe, like the faked moon landing and things of that nature in order to make flat earth make sense, then yes, it all kind of starts to fall apart. But at first glance, to people who struggle with the concept of gravity, yes, it does seem like an easy explanation. And I'm not trying to sound mean by saying this, but I think that someone who can't understand gravity or very, very, very basic science is probably more likely to fall down this rabbit hole and insist how right they are, dig their heels in, and say that the rest of the world is wrong, as opposed to recognizing like, hey, these basic scientific concepts are either too advanced for me or weren't explained to me properly. There are most certainly things in my childhood that were explained to me very simply, and as an adult, I learned the complexities behind them or just went into my own rabbit hole down it because I was still interested. But you know, hey, I guess not everyone does that. Anyway, today what I would like to do is go over some of the concepts that Flat Earth does believe, aside from the obvious, the Earth is flat terminology. They have their evidence, and there's massive air quotes here on the evidence portion to support this, and I wanna kinda pick it apart bit by bit and disprove a lot of the misconceptions behind this Flat Earth theory. I've heard before that plenty of people, according to Mark Sargent, end up believing in Flat Earth because they struggle to debunk it. So let's debunk it together. Now, as many of you guys know, it's the new year and it's time to refocus on taking care of yourself. And today's sponsor, Daily Harvest, is making that just a little bit easier. Daily Harvest is a company that is delivering delicious food built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. My favorite thing from them is smoothies right now. I'm addicted to smoothies. I love them. They're so easy to just make and consume. They have a chocolate blueberry one that is literally just mm, chef's kiss here. It's blueberries, bananas, spinach, almond, cacao maca. It's so good, but they also have like strawberry and peach, mint and cacao. There's like so many variations here of things for you to try. And they have smoothies, flatbreads, they have bowls and soups as well. And the thing that's really important to me is they don't use preservatives, added sugar, or artificial anything. And they just launched their first ever plant-based milk collection, starting with almond milk. Daily Harvest milk is made of only almonds and a dash of sea salt. That's it. And Daily Harvest is also committed to minimizing their environmental impact. They're in the process of transitioning to 100% compostable, recyclable, plant-based, and renewable fiber packaging. Daily Harvest is undeniably delicious, clean food without any of the prep, which makes it much easier for me. So if you wanna get started today, go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code CASKET to get $25 off your first box. Again, that's promo code CASKET for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. And if any of you get this and decide to try some of the smoothies, let me know what you think and what are your favorites and do you like the chocolate and blueberry one or is that just a me thing? Let me know. Again, dailyharvest.com. (laughs) 
one of the biggest pieces of evidence flat earthers claim are flight patterns. Mark Sargent, again, a noted flat earther, said that when he looked at real world flight patterns, none were coming from the Southern hemisphere. But like, it's just a straight up lie. Like, I don't know how else to say that, but he's simply wrong here. This is an insanely easy test to perform to see planes coming from the Southern hemisphere. And there's a logical explanation for why planes don't fly in a straight line. The reason for this is down to simple mathematics and physics. The circumference of the Earth is a lot further around the equator than it is at its higher or lower altitudes towards the poles of the Earth. Such is the spherical shape of our planet. Flying around the smaller circumference of the Earth is called the Great Circle Route and also very noticeable for flights from the US and Asia will fly far above Alaska and Siberia rather than what would appear to be a straight line. If you think about drawing a line around a globe in the middle where it's widest versus towards the North or South Poles, the differentiation of distance begins to become apparent and it not only saves a huge amount of time, but also fuel. And it is possible that perhaps I am misinterpreting what flat earthers believe, but from the sounds of things, their argument is that, oh, look at all the planes up in the Northern hemisphere where their center of the earth is. They're flying that way because the earth is flat and the Southern hemisphere is really where the ice wall is, that Antarctica or the South wall is really the ice wall. Guess this might not take long because that one was not really difficult to debunk, honestly. Not to mention this, but why wouldn't the plane see this supposed ice wall? If we have a gigantic ice wall surrounding the earth, then why can't planes fly over it and see to the other side? Wouldn't planes be able to see proof of this? Well, a lot of flat earthers call this the Pac-Man effect, that once a plane reaches one end of the flat earth, they teleport to the other side. You know, like in the video game, Pac-Man. This is, this is a real theory they put forward, guys. See what I mean about having to believe even more crazy conspiracies like the deeper you get into this that are so blatantly false? It's one thing to be skeptical of NASA or the government, but it's so infuriating to see people forcing their ideas to work, blaming actual teleportation in order to support their theories. Hell, some flat earthers even deny gravity altogether and say the only force in nature is electromagnetism. If gravity doesn't support their theories, throw that bitch out. Basic logic does not support their theories, throw that shit out the window too. As for our next topic, that's gonna be the seasons. If the earth is flat and the sun and moon are just hovering above us, then how could we have seasons? Some have said that relatives and fellow flat earthers claim the sun shifts from one side of the flat earth to the other, but that doesn't explain why New York and LA or places that are in the entire same season have different times when the sun sets. According to Live Science, in the most popular flat earth maps, the North Pole sits roughly at the center of the planetary disk, while Antarctica forms a giant ice wall along the planet's circumference. The equator forms a ring hallway between the two. Many modern flat earthers now believe that the sun sits about 3000 miles over the earth, but Robotham's general idea remains popular in the community. Here's how members of the Flat Earth Society, one of the foremost flat earth activist groups in the world, describe the idea on their official wiki page. The sun moves in circles around the North Pole. When it is over your head, it's day. When it's not, it's night. The light of the sun is confined to a limited area and it acts like a spotlight upon the earth. The diameter of these sun circles governs the seasons. According to one popular theory, the sun circles closest to the North Pole in June, then spends the next six months spiraling slowly outward towards the ice wall at the edge of the world. In December, the sun reverses course and spirals back inward again. During the spring and autumn equinoxes, the sun circles in a perfect loop around the equator, casting light on half of the disk world at any given time. Voila, seasons. This explanation has had its problems. For starters, a sun circling 3000 miles above a flat earth would never actually set, even in the most Southern latitudes. YouTube user Wolfie6020, a globe earth proponent, demonstrated this by building a scale model of the flat earth style sun as it would be seen from Sydney on the vernal equinox. As shown in his video, the sun, actually a drone carrying a ping pong ball, never dips below the horizon, even at its farthest point from the observer. Moreover, during an equinox, the sun appears to rise due east and set due west everywhere on earth except at the poles. 
For this to hold true on a flat earth, where some cities are physically many times farther away from the sun than others, the sunlight would have to bend at hundreds of different angles simultaneously. That's the only way it could appear as if it was always coming from the east. YouTube user Flat Out, another prolific globe earth proponent, demonstrated the impossibility of this explanation using simple computer simulations in 2017. So far, no flat earth model has been able to resolve these problems. So the thing here is that flat earthers aren't simply rejecting the idea of earth being a globe, they're rejecting sunsets too. I get that not everyone is an astronaut and will see how the earth is round with their own two eyes, but how can someone deny a sunset? I mean, hell, I just had a beautiful one today in Colorado. By this very logic, sundials wouldn't work either. And with the sun so close, we'd surely be burning to a crisp as well, right? I can really hardly consider it logic by any stretch of the imagination. The thing is, all this got me wondering how people proved the earth was round thousands of years ago. If the same reasoning worked back then, surely it would work today too, right? It was a Greek mathematician, Eratosthenes, who helped prove the earth is a globe over 2000 years ago. And how did he do this, you might ask? He did it with a stick in the ground, the simplest, basic test. Eratosthenes had heard in Syene, a city south of Alexandria, no vertical shadows were cast at noon on the summer solstice. The sun was directly overhead. He wondered if this were also true in Alexandria. So on June 21st, he planted a stick directly in the ground and waited to see if a shadow would be cast at noon. It turns out there was none, and it measured about seven degrees. Now, if the sun's rays are coming in at the same angle at the same time of day, and a stick in Alexandria is casting a shadow while a stick in Cyrene is not, it must mean that the Earth's surface is curved. And Erastosthenes probably already knew that. The idea of a spherical Earth was floated around by Pythagoras around 500 BC and validated by Aristotle a couple centuries later. If the Earth really was a sphere, he could use his observations to estimate the circumference of the entire planet. Since the difference in shadow length is seven degrees in Alexandria and Syene, that means the two cities are seven degrees apart on Earth's 360 degrees surface. He hired a man to pace the distance between the two cities and learned that they were 5,000 stadia apart, which is about 800 kilometers. He could then use simple proportions to find the Earth's circumference. 7.2 degrees is 1 50th of 360 degrees. So 800 times 50 equals 40,000 kilometers. And just like that, a man 2,200 years ago found the circumference of our entire planet with just a stick and his brain. And look, I hate math, right? You guys know I hate math. When I'm talking about math on this channel, whether it's inflation, percentages, you name it, I have to triple check myself because it's just not my gig. It's not my strong suit. And I admit that. So I'm not going to sit here and say that if you can't make these calculations in your head, then you are foolish or something. But at the very least, I can understand the concept and how he got from point A to point B. In the flat earth model, there's really no explanation for these shadows being so different. If the earth was flat, it simply wouldn't happen. You can't rewrite that one plus one equals two just because you don't like the answer or it doesn't support your warped math or whatever kind of logic you're attempting to use. But that's exactly what these people are doing. From planes to seasons to the circumference of the earth, all of that actual evidence is being ignored. Another aspect of this is other planets. Mark Sargent has argued in interviews before that other planets are nothing but pretty lights and may appear around, but they're not. Not everyone believes this way though, at least according to Newsweek. They brought in a couple of flat earthers and interviewed them asking the question, what about other planets? And here's what they found out. I honestly believe they exist. Davidson, who became a flat earth believer about two and a half years ago, said of other planets in our solar system. For me personally, I just see them as lights in the sky. That belief actually harkens back to an ancient definition of planets as wandering stars, which was first recognized as incorrect by Nicholas Copernicus in 1543. Davidson says that means planets are kind of like stars, definitely not terra firma planets, making them a set of similar but different stars. He also says that our sun isn't the same as other stars since it doesn't twinkle. In fact, our sun is very normal and no stars twinkle. The perceived phenomenon comes from Earth's atmosphere interfering with their light. 
Davidson says he doesn't have any sense of what planets are made of or what shape they would be. I wouldn't go so far as to say everything's flat, he said. The sun, moon, and planets, they appear to be spherical. They could be disks, he added. I don't think it really matters too much, he said. I just don't believe that we're on a sphere. So I guess what we've observed about other planets is another one of those things we're throwing out the window too. Nope, NASA's wrong as well. They've called it a tool of the government, a tool of the new world and a tool of Satan. Even if this were the case, I don't think this explains the planets. After all, anyone with a halfway decent telescope can see the planets and tell that they are definitely not flat. But let's get on to the next thing that debunks flat earth, long distance photography and viewing things from a distance. One example I've seen used in my sources is how a boat simply doesn't turn into a tiny dot on the water the further away it gets. It looks as if it sinks into the horizon because of, you know, the curvature of the earth. As one source explains, it all starts with the horizon. As objects recede from you, they begin to look smaller and slowly disappear in a very unique way. First, their bottoms become hidden and then their tops. If you've ever watched a ship on the horizon, you've seen this for yourself. Similarly, from a great distance, the tops of tall objects like mountains are visible well before their bases. Earth's atmosphere is capable of playing funny tricks on our eyes with different layers of air bending light into interesting directions. This phenomenon, a side effect of Earth's curvature, isn't a surefire guarantee of our planet's curve, but it's a start. But even if you can't look into the horizon for evidence, you can look up. Different stars are visible from different parts of the Earth in two very peculiar ways. First, there is a division between the Northern and Southern hemispheres. So you can see Polaris, the star nearly directly above the North geographic pole of the Earth quite easily in Northern latitudes. But as you travel South approaching the equator, Polaris sinks lower and lower towards the horizon. Once you've crossed that boundary, you can't see it at all. It's blocked by the curve of the Earth in that direction. Similarly, as you travel South, new constellations await your delighted gaze ones that would be completely obscured by Earth's curve if you stayed up north. There's another trick you can play too. If you live in an especially flat area, you'll be able to see stars down to the horizon, but no further because the Earth is in your way. But if you travel up, say to the top of a mountain, you get a better vantage point and can see stars further down than you could before. And flat earthers have yet to explain this. Science can explain long distance photography, the way a boat sinks on the horizon, as well as why skyscrapers are visible despite the curvature of the earth. But flat earth science has yet to do so. I don't think I can go through every single aspect of flat earth today because, you know, we'll be here for a very, very, very long time. And we'll also become continually frustrated as their standards for reasoning sink lower and lower. But I'll debunk these theories for just a bit longer before we talk about why this is so important and one of the reasons why I made this video in the first place. The last of the big conspiracies that flat earthers have is that NASA is lying and controlling us through GMO foods, chemtrails, and vaccines. I think one thing that bothers me so much about this is how flat earthers will say that all of NASA's photos are lying and yet flat earthers have absolutely no photos to prove their own beliefs. I'm not going to get deep into all the other smaller conspiracies or the weird drama that the flat earth has had within itself because that's really not what today's video is going to be about. If you do wanna see that though, I highly recommend the documentary Behind the Curve, but not for the reasons Mark would want you to see it. It has some brilliant moments in there if you know what I mean. Now, right now I'll mention just one of them so you can just get a slice of the pie for this. This happens when another prominent flat earther, Patricia Steer, talks about her experience with some fellow flat earthers. She says that she's been called reptilian. She's been told she drinks blood. Some have accused her of being CIA, a shill or transgender and lying about it too, which these are all just weird and uncomfortable things to say to someone, but I guess that's flat earth lingo. Even if Patricia was transgender, why the hell would that make her less trusted in the community? I guess transphobes can be flat earthers too. Quite shocking, I know. Anyway, the point here is that Patricia says she can and has shown people her birth certificate, her driver's license, photos of her of a child, all of it in an attempt to disprove some of the claims. But they come at her with, well, if you're CIA, that can be faked. 
it becomes a stupid, frustrating battle with these flat earthers. So I guess she knows how we feel to a weird degree. Funny how she doesn't seem willing to connect those dots though. To think that every single person working for NASA is lying or being deceived or that math itself has been constructed to create a false narrative is imaginative for sure. It feels futile to argue with some of these people when they've gone that far down the rabbit hole. The documentary mentions the Dunning-Kruger effect, explaining how sometimes it's the least informed people or the people who understand a topic the least that will be the most confident about it. Maybe it's to mask their insecurities. Maybe it's a total and complete lack of self-awareness. Simplified, I guess I could just call it ignorance. Flat earthers have even bought a ring laser gyroscope and conducted experiments similar to the old Bedford experiment done in the 1800s. And they managed to successfully prove their own theories incorrect with it. Like even their own experiments though, they ignore that because they didn't like the results. If it doesn't support their belief, it's trash. However, it's not all about intelligence either. As one source explains, it would be easy to dismiss flat earthers as simply being misguided due to lack of education. While there are indications that those susceptible to such views have low levels of scientific literacy, Landrum at Texas Tech says that flat earthers aren't necessarily people who don't believe in science. It's not really an education thing, she says. It is really about distrusting authorities and institutions. It seems to be based on both a conspiracy mentality and a deeply held belief that looks like a lot of religiosity, but isn't necessarily specifically tied to a religion. Landron thinks this conspiracy mentality is linked to science denial and a susceptibility to believing deceptive claims on social media. No longer the domain of a foil hat wearing fringe, she believes those with a conspiracy mentality have lost the ability to judge when to trust and when to be a skeptic. Their lack of trust and authority includes not just scientists, but scientific bodies such as NASA, all of whom they think are part of a massive conspiracy to prevent the flat earth truth from being revealed. They view the world through this really dark filter where they assume that all authorities and institutions and corporations are just there to exploit you. Nick Effingham, a philosopher at the University of Birmingham in the UK who has met flat earthers at a London meetup, says that we often don't recognize the extent to which confidence in authority shapes our beliefs. When we try and prove something like the earth being round because it's a belief that we are so sure of, we underplay the justified role of authority in that, he says. Most people are therefore comfortable accepting the world as a globe, even if they can't immediately recount the scientific evidence. Lee McIntyre at Boston University states, flat earthers seem to have a very low standard of evidence for what they want to believe, but an impossibly high standard of evidence for what they don't want to believe. And I'm not gonna sit here and pretend the government is perfect and doesn't make mistakes or that every single conspiracy theory out there is false. I love investigating. That's what my channel's all about, obviously. But flat earthers are coming at it from such a biased perspective that it's impossible to really take them seriously. Not just because the theory is laughable, but science is supposed to be about finding the truth. It's supposed to be about answering a question with evidence, not gathering up everything that supports your theory and ignoring the mountains of proof that don't. I know I've already said this, but it's so annoying to see clear, irrefutable evidence dismissed as nonsense. This is worse than arguing with Hunbots, and to some extent, there's simply no point in doing so. Seriously, they say they want to travel to Antarctica and do an expedition there, and yet the boats that they'd use, the navigation systems, aren't built around a flat earth. Here's what the Guardian said. The cruise organized by the Flat Earth International Conference promises to be a lovely time. Flat earthers who include the rapper B.O.B. and reality TV person Tila Tequila, side note, Jesus fucking Christ, will be able to enjoy restaurants, swimming pools, and perhaps even an artificial surf wave. There's just one problem for those seeking to celebrate the flatness of the earth. The navigational systems, cruise ships, and other vessels use slash rely on the fact that the earth is not flat, theoretically puncturing the beliefs of the flat earth crowd. Ships navigate based on the principle that the earth is round, said Hank Kiher, a former cruise ship captain who sailed all around the globe during a 23 year career. Nautical charts are designed with that in mind, that the earth is round. Kehir, who now works as a forensic marine expert for Robson Forensic, said the existence of GPS, the global positioning system, alone is proof the earth is a sphere, not a flat disk. GPS relies on 24 main satellites which orbit the earth to provide positional and navigational information. 
the FEIC did not respond to requests for more information on the Flat Earth cruise. The organization could potentially try to staff the cruise ship with a crew that does not think the Earth is round, but Kahir said that would be difficult. I have sailed 2 million miles, give or take, he said. I have not encountered one sea captain who believes the Earth is flat. All right, so we've gone through the theories. We've debunked a lot of their main beliefs. I think we've gone through some of their explanations too, which are interesting, I guess. But now what? Why make this video? Well, there's two ways of looking at this situation. One was featured in the Behind the Curve documentary. One scientist explains that he doesn't believe the problem truly comes from flat earth, but from the scientists that shame them. He says, shaming someone into believing something should never be the way to go about things. It only creates more problems, belittles people, and many people have joined Flat Earth because the scientific community, simply put, made them feel stupid. Asking questions should be encouraged. I agree with that mindset, a thousand percent. And yet I agree with another mindset seen from sources too, that this is dangerous. It's dangerous because the community seems to encourage willful ignorance and the idea that the government or NASA and basic science is all a lie. There hasn't been an effective way to fight against science denial as we even saw in the 1800s when Wallace's life was threatened, all because he proved the earth is a globe. So then what do we do? If there's no convincing people of basic facts and ignoring flat earthers or arguing with them only cements their beliefs, then is there any hope at all? Lee McIntyre told Newsweek that a better way to respond is to stop talking about proof, certainty, and logic and start talking more about scientific values. In my book, The Scientific Attitude, Defending Science from Denial, Fraud, and Pseudoscience, I defend the idea that what is most distinctive about science is not its method, but its attitude. The idea that scientists care about evidence and are willing to change their views based on new evidence. This is what truly separates scientists from their deniers and imitators. There can be, to one very small extent, common ground. Flat earthers have called themselves truth seekers, and science is supposed to be all about that, finding the truth and evidence to support a theory. So at least those core values are the same. And I think Lee is on to something when he explains how cognitive bias and the decline of traditional media play into this science denial. He has books on the topic, by the way, and it does seem like something that would interest you, then, you know, take a look and, and, you know, maybe have a read. It's something I'm probably gonna pick up and read in my spare time as well, just to kind of understand it better. But I think his mindset is probably one of my favorite out of all these sources. It's not mocking, and yet he takes the situation seriously. The flat earth conspiracy is hilarious, certainly. To some degree, it, it, someone like me, who most certainly believes the earth is globe, like I'm a globe head or whatever they call me in the (laughs) insults. Um, I believe the earth is a globe. And to me, that seems pretty obvious. And there's so many tests and theories to prove that. We even have photographic evidence. So when someone denies something so blatantly obvious that they can see with their own eyes, it's, it's weird to me. And I sometimes laugh almost out of uncomfortableness of how could someone just, just be this far gone. But as much as I have my uncomfortable or awkward laughs about it, I've got to remember that if we cut out flat earthers or dismiss them all as delusional and everyone refuses to speak to them, well then the only people they've got left to talk to are other flat earthers. And it becomes one giant dangerous echo chamber. And that doesn't serve them well, and it most certainly doesn't serve science either. The documentary even argues that if these people call themselves truth seekers and they have an inquisitive nature, then perhaps many of these flat earthers could have been scientists if only they were more scientifically literate. It's not only a shame, but it's so concerning how far this has gone. It's a weird position to be in to say the least. I don't have all the answers on how to handle this. And if you disagree with me, that's absolutely fine. I guess I just wanted to share my opinion on the topic and see what you guys thought about it and let me know what you think about in the comment section down below. I'm curious for your opinions. Although for any flat earthers who may have potentially made it this far into the video, which I'll be impressed, but hello. If you go into my comment section and you leave me at the bottom of this video, nasty comments calling me all sorts of interesting, vile, you know, transphobic names as you have done in past streams, I will corral those answers and I will read them back live and comment on them. So please don't be one of those people. If you want to have discourse, that's fine. If you want to insult me, 
take it somewhere else that doesn't solve any of your concerns, beliefs, or issues that you might have. As for the audio listeners, you guys know there's no comment section, but if you go to the YouTube video and you look in the comment section, good luck to you. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. And I hope you guys liked it. And if you did, make sure to hit that like button. If you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well. And if you want to see even more content from me, then you can click open that description box and you can see my second channel, third channel, all my social media, all that good stuff. It'll be inside a link tree link. It's the only link that just says like all my socials or whatever. And it's just a nice little easy organized landing page that, you know, I, I like organization. So everything's nicely organized, easy to find, easy to click on. And it's all there. So thank you guys so much for making it to another video. I love you guys and I will see you in the next one. Bye.